have our Gideon speaker this morning. Uh, Brother Keith Everett's going to come, and he's going to speak this morning, and then we'll have our worship service uh, following that. So, Brother, come on. Tell you what, while he's coming, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love and your grace. And Father, we just ask now that you take over this place. Father, that you allow the Holy Spirit to get, move freely among us. Father, that you grow us, that you bring us to that knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, not only that knowledge, but you bring us to the commitment of the love and grace that he shared for us. Father, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Everett. I'm with the uh, Union County Gideon Camp uh, in El Dorado, and it's my pleasure to be here. I met Brother Dan O. What about a month ago? At a at a noontime devotional that that we have at uh, South Ark Community College, y'all's church. I think sponsored that, fed us a meal. We're very appreciative of that, and it was, it was good to meet him for the first time. And then I followed up. And uh, I finally got his phone number, which is kind of precious like gold, but we called him and uh, one of our brothers made an appointment and here I am today. So uh, it's, it's good to be here. Uh, the, the Gideons are busy. That's the, the main thing I can tell you today. Uh, we're busy passing out Bibles. We're busy reaching people with the Word of God. We uh, pass out Bibles in the public schools, all the public schools that will let us, not all the public schools anymore will let us come in, but we pass out Bibles in the fifth grade of any of the schools that will let us come in. Okay? We also uh, you know, pass them out in the Christian schools, uh, and then we, put, we place uh, the full Bible in uh, the hotels and motels in the community, again, those that will let us. We also uh, place Bibles in the hotel, not hotel, the doctor's hospital waiting rooms, dentist waiting rooms, and things like that. So anywhere uh, people are going to be, uh, especially if they're waiting and things like that, we try to place God's Word. And we never know how many people that will reach. We're told that a Bible that's in a hotel room has the capacity to reach about 2,500 people as long as it's there. And we, we go through, not only do we place Bibles in the hotel rooms, but we go by occasionally and we will uh, refresh those. We'll take out any Bibles that have been damaged or written in or anything like that. And then we'll uh, get my timer going here. Uh, and we'll uh, put new Bibles in there. <clears throat> but we don't throw those Bibles away. We take those Bibles that come out of hotel rooms. They're hardback, full Bibles, Old and New Testament, and we recover those with a soft cover, and those are the Bibles we, we distribute in prisons because in a prison we can't, we can't pass out a hardback Bible. There's too many things I guess prisoners can do with it, so we give softback Bibles in the prisons, in the jails. Uh, and then we also uh, we visit the police departments, the fire departments. Uh, we pass Bibles out to uh, soldiers that are being deployed. When I was still in Camden, that's my hometown, uh, the National Guard unit in Camden was being called up to go to Iraq, and before they left, we were able to give each uh, soldier a camouflage Bible, full, full copy of the Bible. So we, you know, we pass Bibles out all over the community. We also cover the state. Uh, we will have blitzes in certain communities where we pass out Bibles to the entire community. Uh, all the people that we can reach uh, on street corners, places like that. And we will have a, you know, a group effort where Gideons from throughout the state will come together and, and help in that, uh, in that distribution. And then I know like our Gideon camp in, in Washtenaw County, before I left there, we would... Uh, we would go to the fair and we would go to the Tate Barn sale, if you've ever been to that, and pass out Bible. So anywhere that we can find a place to distribute God's Word, we will. And we are really an extension of your church because we get into places maybe the church can't get into. Um, and we travel throughout the, the nation and, and all over the world. Right now, I think there are Gideon camps um, in 122 countries. And that's interesting because there's only about 134, 35 recognized countries throughout the world. So we've got a lot of them covered. 
And any time that we we travel, <clears throat> we travel on our own dime. When I came down here, I, I bought my own gas. I wasn't, I'm not re reimbursed for the gas, and that's fine. Um, and so in doing that, every dollar that anybody gives to the Gideon goes strictly for the purchase of Bibles. No monies that you, that you donate to the Gideons goes for overhead, goes for administration, goes for cost. It all goes 100%. To purchase God's word, and that's that's our one of our selling points because I don't know many organizations that are that thrifty with the dollars that are donated. They usually have to take something out for for administrator and overhead. But uh, so, like I say, we we pass Bibles out in all kind of places, and we never know sometimes when we pass out a Bible what somebody's going to do with it. Sometimes they don't really want the Bible; they just don't want somebody else to get it. And one time. Uh, there was a group in um, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in Brazil, they speak Portuguese, so if we're in a foreign country, we try to have a, uh, a Gideon Bible in their language. And the one that we pass out most often, we call the Personal Workers Testament. This is the one. Uh, I think they're up to a dollar and a quarter now, a piece to print. But we print these in a lot of different languages. And we were, in that, that day, they were handing out Portuguese because that's the national language of uh, Brazil. But one young lady took the Bible and she tore it. She didn't want it for herself. She just didn't want somebody else to get it and threw it on the ground. It was windy that day. The wind was blowing and it blew pages everywhere. So the Gideons were trying to pick up, you know, the mess. And one of those pages blew down the street to a man that was working on a rooftop. Okay. He didn't have any idea what was going on up the street, but he saw this piece of paper coming towards him or, or coming up by him, and he grabbed it, and he read it, okay? One page of one Bible reached that man, that's all it takes with the Holy Spirit's work. So he comes back up the street to see where the Bible came from because he saw the crowd up there. And uh, he told the Gideon, he said, I, I want the rest of this book. I know there's more to this book than in one page. And so they were glad to give him a copy of God's Word, okay? Uh, another time, there was a prisoner in a federal prison in Florida, Gainesville, Florida. And uh, he was given a personal worker's testament like I showed you. He didn't want it to read. He wanted it so he could tear the pages out and roll it up and smoke whatever he could find to smoke in it, Okay. He'd already torn out the book of Matthew from his Bible. But one day the Holy Spirit touched him. Before he tore out that page, he read it. I think he was down in the book of Mark by this time. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And the next time the, the pastor, the chaplain came, he said, I want to know more about what this book is telling me because I've read things I've never heard before. And he was saved because of that Bible. But it doesn't stop there. After he got out of prison, he became a pastor. And two of his other sons were saved because of that Gideon Bible. And one day he was preaching a revival in another town, and he left that Bible at the church, and he was just distraught because he couldn't find his Bible. That was his favorite Bible. And uh, I think it was some months later, somebody called him and asked him, did he leave a Bible in their church with Matthew torn out of it. He said, that's my Bible right there. I want it back. So he said, I'll, I'll come get it. And the guy said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll mail it to you. So like I say, we don't always know what people are going to do with the scripture that we pass out, uh, how they're going to treat it. But we pray before any distribution. We pray before any service or anything like that. Uh, we pray every week. We have meetings every week that, that we meet in pr just for prayer. Uh, but the Gideons were started in 1899 by two businessmen that met in a hotel room. And uh, they met, and at that time there wasn't many rooms at that, at that hotel room. I think it was snowy at that time. And one of the Christians there had a Bible, the other one didn't. And they got to talking about how great it would be if they could put Bibles in the hotel rooms. And so from those two men, the Gideons International was started. And to date, well, I think a couple of years ago, we passed the two billion, okay. Uh, let me turn it off. 
I'll find the right button here in a minute. Okay. They, they passed the $2 billion, that's with a B, distribution mark, okay, that we passed out over $2 billion Bibles. Uh, so we're still busy. We pass out hundreds of thousands of Bibles a year, and we're still busy doing that, not only in the United States, but, but across the world. So I would appreciate your prayers for the Gideons. I'm going to be back in the back. Uh, Brother Lofton will be back there with me to take up a collection. And like I say, every penny that you give goes directly to purchasing Scripture. I ask also if there's anybody that might be led to join the Gideons. We're always looking for members. You have to go through your pastor, which sometimes is easier said than done. But you have to go through your pastor for a recommendation. But we'd be happy to, to uh, talk with you about that, okay? Thank you for your time. I encourage you to support this ministry. I encourage you to, you know, you heard it was a dollar fifty for a Bible that they can put in somebody's hand. Uh, we all got a dollar fifty laying around somewhere, uh, for sure. They will be out back. Uh, the thing that struck me is I've been telling you over and over again how the Word of God can change people's lives. One simple page out of a Bible changed a man's life. Isn't that amazing? Then he wanted more. You see, when you finally get a hold of who Jesus is, you always want more. Second thing is, don't put a timer on me. I don't want this whole place going off. I can hear it now, boy. <laughs> Let's pray for the Gideons, and then we'll start our worship service. Father God, we just thank you. Father, I thank you for Brother Ever I thank you for what he uh, is doing, Father. I thank that you put it on his heart, Father, to be a, a minister. Father, we're all ministers in different ways. And Father, I just pray for the Gideons. I pray for Gideons International, Father, that your word continues to go out into this world. Father, help us to be part of that ministry. Help us to be part of giving your word to a lost and dying world. Father, I ask now that you overcome this place, that there would be only the Holy Spirit left so that we may worship freely. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning? Amen. And everybody wide awake, ready to go. Stand with us and let's watch us. Who's that?
We have heard a word this morning that touched our hearts about a lot of missionaries that are sending out the word. And I know our missionaries depend a lot on the Gideon's Bibles that come to those countries. He, when he said the, was talking about Brazil, it reminded me of a time when we were in Brazil. The first time I went, we, we printed out our testimony and they put it in, in Portuguese and in English. And we... Uh, had the plan of salvation on it also with our picture and they told us that these people are so they don't have anything if they get a piece of paper they hang on to it forever so that that testimony for years might be go out go out to the people and I was thinking about those pages of that Bible someone picked those pages up in Brazil and they probably meant a lot to them also so it's there's more ways than one to, to for us to share the gospel. This morning we're going to we're thinking about Lottie Moon. That is a name that has stood the test of time. She was born in December 12th, 1840, and that's 180 years ago. But we're still thinking about Lottie Moon and her faith and the work that she did for Jesus Christ our savior. She was um, she loved her parents loved Jesus and they they were wealthy plant, plantation owners, and they went to church and took Lottie and her six brothers and sisters to church. But Lottie Moon was a mischievous, bad little girl. Any of you know any bad little girls? But anyway, she was not interested in church. She didn't like it. She made fun of it, and she just went until she was 18 years old. She went away to college, and she was able to do this because her family was wealthy and uh, not many girls were able to go to college and she was the, one of the first women to get a master's degree. And after, while she was at college, she went to a revival with um, some friends and there she met Jesus for real and she accepted him into her heart and her life was changed. Lottie Moon was a teacher for many years. She taught in a, in a, around in Virginia, but at age 33, she went to uh, China as a missionary and in China, she taught the women and the children uh, to read, and she taught them Bible stories, and she spread the gospel of Jesus to uh, people around. And uh, Lottie Moon was uh, passionate about her, her work in there. And when, in 1912, I think it was, she, there was a war and the famine in China, and the people were starving. Lottie Moon loved these people dearly. They were... Um, they were her family and she loved them and Lottie Moon took the money that she had and the food that she had and gave it to the people that she loved so dearly and as a result she became ill and she was put on a ship and to go come back to America but on Christmas Eve in 1912 she died aboard that ship before she got back to America but while Lottie was in China she wrote letters home she was just as rebellious about that. She had courage. She was a little bitty tiny lady, but she had a lot of courage and was brave, and she didn't mind asking for help. She asked for money. She asked for people to come and help her tell the people about Jesus. And after she died, about a year after she died, the uh, Southern Baptist Convention uh, decided to start this offering that we still have today, the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. This Christmas, as we think about the gifts we're to give, let's remember our gift to Jesus. Let's let it be our best gift this year. <clears throat> and also remember to give to the Gideons. Oh, 
to imagine the kingdom of kings and the world of the world. Lord, thank you for what you do coming to this earth. Lord, and living as a man. Lord, we praise you for your salvation. Father, we praise you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, you allow us to live on you. So, Lord, you be with us as we open your door. We will go down and support you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, we'll begin in the 12th verse. I'm going to ask if you would stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, authoritative word. Verse 12, it says, In the next day a large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey colt. His disciples did not understand these things, but first, at first, but when, he, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things which had been written about him and had done, been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowds went and met him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. Father, I thank you, Father, for the presentations that we've heard this morning of how your word moves, whether it be through the Gideons, whether it be through Lottie Moon. Father, I just pray for more people to stand up, uh, more people to be rebellious against the world. Father, to carry our word out, to carry your word out into this world. Father, I love to hear the stories of how just one page of your word changes lives. How when somebody tries to destroy your word, Father, you use it to glorify yourself. Father, this morning as we break open your word, as we look at your word, Father, I pray that you do the same. Father, you glorify yourself. As always, Father, I ask you to remove me from this pulpit. Use me as a tool that you may be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. See, y'all thought y'all was going to get out of this, didn't you? <laughs> if you want to title this, you can title it, Not a Political King, But a Promised Savior. Not a Political King, But a Promised Savior. Uh, if you remember, last week we talked about Mary, and we talked about her anointing Jesus and, and, and anointing his body for burial. Uh, if you remember, if you were here last week, that's exactly what she did. She not only anointed his feet out of, out of honor and glory for, her, for him, but it was a sign of the anointing, the anointing of his coming death. And, and we get into the, the triumphant entry, I'm sure is what's the heading of your Bibles, more than likely, the, the triumphant entry. Uh, but this is a confusing triumphant entry. Especially for the Jews, especially for the people of that day. Now, we kind of understand it. We kind of understand what Jesus is doing. But the people of that day were, 
probably standing there going, huh? We were expecting a king to come in. We were expecting him to come on in on a horse, and we were expecting him to take over. We were expecting him to kill all of our enemies, and he stand as king, and we stand with him. They had a vision in their head as to who Jesus, the Messiah, would be. Isn't that so true of us? We come along times where we're troubled, where somebody lords over us or something is happening in our life and we, we expect Jesus to come in like a, like a roaring lion and take care of it all and wipe it all off. That's in our brains. Yet he comes in as a gentle lamb to give us peace, to give us comfort in those hard times. You see, he doesn't come to take the hard times away. He doesn't come to, to rule as a king, a forceful king. He comes to change our lives. He comes to change us into him and into his son. To love our enemies enough that we give them the word of God so that they too may know the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in our minds what Jesus is supposed to do and what we think he should do in our life. Well, I'm having financial problems, then I need to pray to the Lord so he can get me out of these financial problems. And he may not. You see, I preached not too long ago about the trouble that, that comes our way, that, that what happens in our life, that God is not an angry God. God's not a God who uses our trials and our tribulations to, to get us, but to teach us. He wants us to grow closer to Him. He wants us to, to get in a relationship with Him that when we know something is coming, we know who we can rely on. We know who we can stand on. Regardless of the storms that are going on in our lives, we know that He is the one who steadies the ship. He's the one that we need to rely on. Let the storms rage. Let the issues come. God never changes. Not ever. But see, we look at Him as a roaring lion. We look at him as a, a, a triumphant king that comes in with a sword. Yet he comes in with humility. He comes in with peace. He comes in with grace and mercy. And it's like, I don't need all that. I need you to take care of my problems. And yet, the whole time he's saying, I am. If you'll just believe, I am. As we begin to look at our story this morning, as we begin to look at our scripture today, it says, In the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now, we know that a large crowd had gathered at Lazarus' house because Jesus was there and Lazarus was there. And they wanted to see what was going on. They wanted to see the man that Jesus raised from the dead. They, they crowded up. Isn't it amazing when something's going on how people crowd up? I mean, you set, let something go on down the road, and I guarantee you everybody in their mama crowd up. We'll go see what's happening. Uh, sometimes, most of the time, it's not to help them. It's just to watch them. Right? Uh, whose house burning? I don't know, 50 cars will drive by. It won't be one, every, one a week, but when something starts burning, 50 cars drive by because they want to see what's happening crowd had begun to gather for the feast of the Passover. Thousands of Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Passover, and this is right before the Passover, and they begin to come, and they hear that Jesus, the man who had healed the blind person, the, the man who had healed the lame, the man who was doing miracles, and not only that, that the man, Lazarus, the one who had died, who had been dead for four days, who stunk in the, in the tomb, who said, no, we don't want to bring him out because he stinks. This man is coming to Jerusalem. He's coming to the place of his death because the Jews hate him. Let's go see what he's about to do. Isn't that our curiosity? I wish more people would come to church wanting to know what Jesus is about to do. Amen? Y'all, help me out this morning. We should come to church every Sunday just to see what Jesus is about to do. 
whose life he's about to change, who, whose life he's fishing to turn upside down, who he's fishing to set free, who he's fishing to reveal himself to. That's the reason that we should come to church to see what he's up to so that we can be changed in the process and give him glory. They gathered. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know what was going on. And when they heard he was coming, they heard that the king was coming. So they went to get branches and they began to lay them in the road just like they would do a welcome a king home. And they would lay them in the road. They would put cloaks on the ground as he rode in to say, here comes the king. They want to recognize him for their king, not who he was. He said, so they took the branches and went out and met him crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Hosanna means save now. Save. Oh, I beseech thee, save. Save us, Lord. That's what it means. They were saying, save us from the Roman tyranny. Save us from the Romans. Save us from this government. Save us from the shackles that we're in. Save us from all of that. You see, they didn't really realize who Jesus was. That he was the actual Messiah that they had been looking for. They were confused. They had been taught to be looking for a man who would come in on a white horse with a big sword. They were saying, save us, save us. Save us how we want to be saved. Isn't that so true with us? Well, Lord, you know, I prayed about this, and even though you answered my prayer, even though I see how you did it, that's not how I'd have done it. Right? Isn't that way we are? Or, Lord, when are you going to answer that prayer that I prayed six months ago? When are you going to heal so-and-so? When are you going to provide this? When are you going to do this? And the whole time he's working, we're just not looking for him. Why? Because we're looking for our solution, not his. We're looking to our own selves, our own abilities, our own talents, instead of looking towards the one who can heal, the one who can save, and the one who can give us life full of peace and comfort. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. If you will look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly. Hosanna! O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, O daughter of Israel. Behold, your king is coming. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. They knew scripture. They knew that he was not going to come in on a horse with a sword. They knew he was going to come in humble with peace. Yet they still wanted him to do it their way. Can I tell you, God's not going to do it your way. He's going to do it his way. And he ain't Elvis Presley. I did it my way. Y'all ain't never heard this song before. Have mercy. Y'all got to help me this morning. The donkey was a sign of peace. Not a sign of war. It was a sign that he was bringing peace to the world. In the midst of chaos, Jesus was bringing something that the world did not know. And that was peace. Peace in every chaos. You see, if he rode in on a horse, he would have rode in as a warrior, not a savior. You see, but instead of beating his enemies by force, he defeated them by dying. Y'all hold on to that, okay? Y'all listen to that. Instead of him riding in on a white horse with a sword and slaying every one of them, he defeated them by dying. How did he defeat them? 
He died. Yet he rose again, something that they could not do and could not handle. Something that a sword could not accomplish. Yet the blood of Jesus could. You know, I wish I could be a man like Jesus. You know, in my day, I, you know, I've, I've fought. I've done all kinds of things in my life. And I've been a man's man. And been there and done that. Not proud of it. I've just been there and done that. You see, but I wish I could be more like Jesus. You see, Jesus climbed up on a donkey, a colt of a donkey. And instead of worrying about himself, instead of worrying about what was fixing to happen to him in Jerusalem, instead of saying, guys, y'all get me out of here because I'm going to die, instead of walking away from what God had planned for him, he climbed up on this donkey, humbled himself in peace, and he rode towards his death. Our amazing God riding to his death to be king. How in the world could he do that? Yet he did it because he loved us. He died because he loved us. He knew that he had to die so that he could save us. See, he didn't come to be a political king, a temporary king. He didn't come just to, to, to rule the earth. He came to rule everything. He came to be Savior, not king, even though he is the king. You see, had he come in as a warrior, we wouldn't know what salvation is. He came in as a Savior to save the world from ourselves. Verse 16, it says, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So many times we come to church and we don't understand what's going on. Even the 11 or the 12 people that was with Jesus, when they were looking at Jesus and they couldn't understand, they, they knew in their hearts that he was riding to his death. They knew what was fixing to happen. They had been taught that. And they were confused about what he was going to do because they too wanted a king, wanted someone to come in and win over Rome. They too missed that he was coming not to be king of the world, but king of everything and to give us life. Well, I don't come to church, preacher, because I just don't feel like I'm well enough to come. I, I don't come to church because I've done bad things in my life. They had a person in this room that had done bad things in their life. And there's not a sin in this world that Jesus didn't shed his blood for. Understand, if you don't understand anything else today, it, regardless of what happened in your life, regardless of what's going on in your life, Jesus died for that sin so that you would know him as Savior and Lord. Don't be perfect. Be a child of God. You don't have to come perfect. I don't care if you come in blue jeans, flip-flops, and, and a t-shirt. I don't care how you come. You know what? I don't think Jesus did either. I think he just says, come. Come as you are. Let's don't miss him. Let's don't miss what happened. Let's don't wait till he, he triumphantly comes back the next time when we go, oh, I see now. You see, he gives us scripture so that we don't have to. 
He gives us the word of God so that when we can look at it, it can change us. So that when we look at it, we can have peace. So when we look at it, we can have joy. So when we look at it, we know that we have a king and a Lord who cares enough to die for us. And he rode straight into Jerusalem knowing farewell what was going to happen. He was already king. But we didn't need a king. We needed a savior. That's why he died. The crowd that had been with him in verse 17, uh, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead and continued to bear witness. I have a question for you this morning. Does your life bear witness to Jesus Christ? You see, they saw Jesus. They saw what he did in Lazarus' life. They saw what he did before that. They knew who he was. God was changing them. Jesus was changing the crowd. And yet they bear witness of who he was. Do you bear witness of him? Has he changed your life so greatly that you bear witness of him? When you leave out of this church, when you go to work, when you go to school, wherever you may go, can people see Jesus in you? They could see it in this crazy crowd. Jesus needs to be first in our life. He needs to be the one that we glorify. He needs to be the one that we raise up on high. Not because we need a king, but because we need a savior. Do we at Three Creeks Baptist Church... Bear witness to Jesus Christ. Do we all together bear witness of who he is? It says the reason why the crowd went to meet him, they had heard about what he had done and how he had done this sign. Look at this crowd this morning. I'm so grateful for this crowd. Absolutely grateful. But y'all, we should have to put people in the front here because there's not enough room in here. I once heard that a church can grow past its leader. Say that with me every day. Who is our leader? Is it me? Or is it God? This church should be full. Who should want to come? Because they hear about what's going on in people's lives at Three Creeks Back. Jesus is doing in our church, in our lives. You see, we need to understand that when God gets loose in a place, not everybody's going to like it. Verse 19, it says, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see what the you, you see what you're getting? Thing. Pharisees were looking at each other and saying, we're losing our power. We're losing our strength. We're losing our say-so over what's happening to Jesus Christ. Y'all, the church should lose its say-so to Jesus every day. I should lose my say-so to Jesus Christ. Look, the world has gone after him. Praise God. When I was 17 or 18 years old, I surrendered to the ministry. Well, I called to the ministry. I didn't surrender. I had a pastor tell me this. He said, Dano, he said, you need, to, you need to follow Jesus Christ. You don't need to 
follow me. Because I will guarantee you in relationship will fail you. But Jesus never will. He hasn't. See, we may be looking in the wrong place. And we may be looking at it the wrong way. See, Jesus didn't come to take over anything but our heart. He already owned it. And I believe if we'll let him do that, he be in the fear. Because people can't get in there. Hosanna. Save us now. God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the word that we've had today. I thank you for the, the praise that we've had today. And Father, I pray if there's anybody in this building that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Father, that today will be that day. Father, they will turn loose to the back of that view. Father, that the world and Satan can't close their mouth about what you're doing in their life. Father, thank you for sending a Messiah. Thank you for sending me a Savior. So that when he does come back to me, I'm in the air. Father, may we glorify you through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's in his name. Amen.